IoT, Internet of Things, there have been massive breakthroughs over the past years, and uh, today almost all companies invest in IoT from every industry. And we're moving from consumer product IoT to B2B IoT. So what we're going to do today here is we're going to explore why IoT will remain the primary driver of the digital transformation. And who would be better to introduce this topic in our opening keynote today than Ralf Wagner? Ralf is the CEO of Mindspace, a Siemens company. And uh, he has a background in computer science and business administration. He combines these two fields. And a decade of experience at Siemens in various international positions, management positions. He's also been a management consultant for years, and he built his own internet startup in the 90s. So experience in various fields and a real expert on IoT, he's going to tell us today why it's time for the industrial IoT. So please help me welcome to the stage Ralf Wagner. Welcome. Hello, hello, Hi. Alex. Wonderful. Good morning. The revolution of digital business models. That's my topic for the next roughly 30 minutes. But before we go into that in more detail, let's get a step back and look at the world around us. It has never been changing as fast as it is changing right now. And we see this. We see this in our private lives each and every day with the devices we use, with the services we, we buy and purchase. And these are the typical examples. And you see them in every presentation potentially around here at Cebit this week, and you have seen this in the last years. These are the disruptors everybody knows and talks about. So I want to give you a little bit of different perspective on why we think these are so successful. What they have all in common is a paradigm shift. They're moving away from selling a product to selling a service being very, very user-centric. So away from moving books, for buying and selling books, but having your Kindle e-book subscription. Or you don't go to the store and think about which CD to buy. For nine bucks per month, you have 40 million songs at the fingertips. So it takes away all this dis uh, disruption in the buying or decision process. You just spend the money, and the decisions are less and less and less. So it makes you easier to consume. You don't call the taxi and sit there and wait and pay them with cash and because it doesn't accept credit card. You call the Uber on your app, and you go there, you enter the car, you leave the car, that's it. It took out all the friction of that pro uh, process, and it's so much user-centric. All the startups, all those uh, uh, unicorns who are so successful have this basically in common. User-centric paradigm shift, move away from a product to a service. So now you can say, oh, why is guy from Siemens is telling me about this kind of consumer stuff? Yeah, we are, yeah, I would expect he's talking about the industrial world. But also there, there is an example which m probably most of you have heard as well. Rolls-Royce started years ago to move away from selling their airplane turbines, the engines, to sell the, as a total care package power by the hour. So it has the same thinking. And there were some pioneers like Rolls-Royce. Oh, sorry. There are some pioneers like Rolls-Royce who did that, and they have been unbelievably successful with that model. Because if you think about it, why should Lufthansa have the experts on maintenance for these turbines? Why should they manage the spare parts? Why should they have all the logistics it's an airline. 
the company that designed and built that turbine knows everything about it. Why shouldn't they do the maintenance, the spare part, and having all the personnel? And let Lufthansa or any other airplane, air, airline focus on their core business, bringing passengers from A to B. And this is exactly the thinking. So they took out the friction for the airlines that they don't need to worry about the turbines anymore and can focus on what their passengers and their clients and customers care about. So as said, this is a, one of the very early examples. And should we expect now the same kind of disruption and revolution which we saw in a lot of consumer industries, also in the industrial space? Maybe not that fast. Why? And that's why I put the R in parentheses here. It's maybe it's more like an evolution in the industrial space. Because you have invested in, in plants, in complete factories. A chemical plant is run for 30 years because you basically rebuild it. So in the industrial world, there are different cycles. But also, they want to take advantage of all these technologies. And if you look, having the technology drivers and having the business drivers. So technology is there now. Yeah? There is all the cloud compute and storage for very low cost. Business models and business drivers are there. Other airlines asking for uh, the same kind of model, not only to Rolls-Royce, but to other engine manufacturers as well. So the, the businesses are, uh, are driving and asking for this as well. So we see from the Siemens perspective that now also the industrial space is on a kind of a tipping point. And I will give you quite a few examples why we think that is the case. Before we go on the examples, it always has to be a benefit before somebody is actually moving to something else. And from an industrial market perspective, we, we always split this in two kind of layers. There is all the equipment suppliers. So the turbines, uh, escalators, windmills, the typical terminal machine builders. They're all companies that produce something themselves, but their products are shipped to somebody else who is then actually operating it. So a, a typical German machine builder is building his machine in his factory and shipping it to Volkswagen Daimler in the manufacturing sites around the world. And then these machines are actually operated there. So in these two groups in the industrial world, they have different objectives and they have different business models. So if you look at the equipment supplier, if they ship their machines somewhere in the, around the world and, uh, you know, in Germany, we, uh, we have a very strong machine building um, industry vertical. We're one of the market leaders here. Same is true for US and, and China, which are very strong in there. But they, li they live from exporting their machines. So they're all far away. And if those machines have issues, they need to help their customers. And they don't have in each and every country where they ship to a service organization. Specifically, if you are not uh, a, a multinational company, but a German machine builder near Stuttgart. So having IoT and IT capabilities linked to your machines, collecting data, you stay connected with the equipment you give to your customer. If you look at the warranty phase, you can react much faster and you know what's going on with that machine. So it significantly helps you to reduce the service and warranty cost because you know how this piece of equipment, compressor, escalator, whatever, is operated right now. You know the health status if you collect data from it. So that's for most the entry point when they think, what can I optimize in my business? Where can, where can I take advantage of technologies like IoT? Staying connected as an equipment supplier with my equipment to optimize service efficiency. But then they start to think about additional offers. And uh, as we have started that journey at Siemens with IoT four years ago already, we, we, we accompany the, the, the companies in that process. So we get a, a lot of uh, consulting there as well. And we are very close to what is actually happening there when then the service organization says, 
if I have that kind of transparency that helps me optimize my service efficiency, why shouldn't I make a business out of this after the warranty phase and say, I have transparency about that asset. Now I, can, I have some certainty about how it's operated and it's run, so I can guarantee the availability. Availability contracts, which before you have connected assets and IoT were way too risky for specifically a medium-sized company to offer that. So additional businesses specifically around services. Then the completely new business models where everybody is talking about, like the Rolls-Royce did, completely switch uh, your company upside down and go to a performance output oriented business. This takes much, much more. So there you need to basically look at every business process uh, in your company and figure out how this fits to you. Yeah? Because only take this uh, uh, simple example, if you're not selling your equipment anymore as an equipment supplier, it stays in your books. So your CFO might have some challenges with that, as you can imagine. So there's a lot of that has to be thought through for these new business models. But as I said, customers of the equipment suppliers start to ask for that because they ask themselves, why do I need to own that compressor? The only thing I need is the compressed air which comes out of it. So why shouldn't I just buy that? And then you're exactly in that kind of discussion. And the last but not least bullet point, and I will have a little bit of deep dive on that later, is when you know how your equipment you produce is operated at your customers, you might derive something out of there which has an impact on how you would design the next generation of that equipment. So if you see how your compressor of uh, a type XYZ is operated, and you see, oh, that motor which I put in there is oversized for 80% of the cases because nobody is going to the limits, the next generation of that compressor, you might resize that, that motor because now you know that is oversized. And you have a feedback loop from the product performance to the product design. And this will change a lot of things and uh, has, has a lot of opportunities. On the operator side, so if you're a manufacturer and you own a plant and you have all these machines, compressors, or you have a wind park, the thing that bothers you most is unplanned downtime. It's all about it. Because that costs you money. If your production line stands still, all the productivity programs you designed for, for the year, uh, which usually gives you 3 to 5% productivity, is gone when you have a standstill, an unplanned standstill in your manufacturing uh, site for a week or so. So unplanned downtime is what has to be avoided. So that's their motivation. Certainly also ma maintenance efficiency and other business models play a role, but the main intention to get started here uh, with the IoT and also give the data from these equipments which they bought from their suppliers to them that motivation is, if I can increase my uptime of my production line, then I would be willing to, to share the data with the equipment uh, supplier because only he knows how to interpret and how to use this data, and I have an advantage with more uptime. So it's a, it's a, a kind of in an ecosystem, it's a give and take. So in these discussions, we see more and more going on in the market. So to enable all of this, so the data-driven services, the new business models, um, Siemens created MindSphere, an open IoT platform, and we call it even an operating system, and I give you some background around that as well. And let me give you a, a glimpse what MindSphere is and how when we talk about it, we, we explain it. So when, when we talk about IoT, it's all about the T, the thing. And the thing needs to be connected. That's why, uh, starting at the bottom, Mind Connect is our complete suite when we talk about connectivity. If you cannot connect, there is no IoT. Simple as that. So it has to be that simple. It has to be plug and play. It has to uh, support all the open standards and, uh, and communication protocols across certain verticals. And uh, this is what we did, and certainly not only Siemens equipment, because that would be no value. 
If you work in any uh, manufacturing plant, if you work in any uh, kind of um, operator site, you find equipment from all kinds of vendors all over the place. And you don't want to exclude any of them as a data source. So it has to be open on the connectivity side, no doubt. And we designed this into the platform from day one. And certainly, security is one of the most important things in IoT. So we don't allow any unencrypted traffic to reach MindSphere. So it is encrypted end-to-end end -end with key rotation. All these kind of things are provided out of the box. MindSphere, the platform itself. So it's cloud-based. Uh, we started on SAP infrastructure. We have it now on AWS infrastructure, as well as the preview on Azure. So it's a cloud-first approach. And we started to make that bet already a couple of years ago, and uh, it was absolutely the right decision. So why do we call it an operating system? Because if you compare it, for example, with the PC and the desktop laptop world, you would never buy a laptop without an operating system. Because if you would have that, you need to ha design and program your own file system, your own printer. If you have a graphical user interface, the windows, the buttons, all this is provided by the operating system. We don't think about that anymore like this. We take it for granted. If you go to the cloud world, you have the infrastructure players like AWS and, and Azure. You have all the infrastructure pieces. You can stitch together your own operating system, but then you need to maintain it, you need to operate it, you need to serve it, you need to upgrade it. You wouldn't do that for Windows or Linux. You take the operating system because all what you care about are the apps. Because in the apps is the value that you actually see. The operating system is the enabler to get to those apps fast, quick, because they provide you all that functionality where you, you don't want to care about. And this is the philosophy behind MindSphere as an op open IoT operating system. So it's all API driven. So it, we opened the APIs uh, last year in summer. And the same that Siemens colleagues use for app development are available for every other developer on MindSphere as well. We have the southbound API for connectivity completely open. And we have what we call the northbound API for applications completely open as well. And last but not least, the top level, that's the apps. There's the value. Well, in the apps, you put all your domain expertise, your algorithms, your, your know-how about the equipment, how to interpret the data, and to provide, actually, the transparency and the insights uh, and the analytics around your assets to get to the values and benefits we saw on the slide before. So a couple of examples where we see that the industrial space is already moving and sometimes faster than we think because it's a little bit under the carpet. Take an example like Eisenmann. Eisenmann is the leading machine builder provider for body shop equipment. Body shop equipment, they ship their machines for, for painting the car, basically, to all the car manufacturers around the world. And they have an, a new concept introduced a while ago with these little carriers. They're, they're not little, by the way. They put the car chassis onto it, and then it gets uh, basically transported through the body shop. And at the end of the body shop, you have the, the car with, uh, with the right color. And with that concept, they flexibilized the production capacity for their customers. Because you just add additional carriers if you need additional capacity in your body shop of the automotive manufacturer. And if you don't need them, you take the carriage out. And they sell this as a service. So they don't sell the little carriage. They sell, OK, you tell me the capacity, and I ship you just in time additional carriages, or I take them out of the production, and I main make do the maintenance for you. I make sure that they're all up and running. A car manufacturer says, this is great. All I need to give you is my required capacity. And you take care about the equipment. Super. But for that, they need the connectivity, not only to the equipment to monitor the health status, that they make sure it's all up and running and, and well operated. They also need the data from the production system, for example. 
So, and with MindSphere 3, we don't only have the connectivity to assets, we now have also a complete framework integrated to connect, connect to all the IT systems, the MAS system, the ERP system, the CRM system, with kind of pre-configured co uh, connectors, because you need and you want to tap into those data sources as well. To calculate an overall equipment efficiency, you need data from your ERP, SAP system, as well as from the shop floor. So bridging the gap between IT and OT is daily life of an IoT app developer. Second example, the Hamlet Group. They're producers of equipment, specifically valves for process industries, where um, you have big plants, a lot of piping, Kilometers, and anybody who has seen BSF in Ludwigshafen, for example, it's the largest uh, uh, chemical site in the world. They, they have hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of pipes with uh, thousands and thousands of valves. And a valve, if you don't think about it, can be a source of data. Because there's a temperature, there's a pressure, there is the reaction time of the valve, which gives you a lot of information about exactly that piece of the process where this valve is sitting. And if you collect them from all those 100,000 valves, it gives you a picture you have never had before from your plant. And uh, the Hamlet Group designed a smart valve where you then collect the data directly, send it to MindSphere, and do a kind of an analytics, which was for the first customers even mind-blowing. The insights they could create about their process, they used this then to optimize process flow and temperature. They reduce the energy usage because they knew, oh, here we have way too much temperature than other pieces, which they hadn't, hadn't done before. And last example here is uh, Festo. Uh, Festo, also a, a, a large medium-sized company for industrial equipment in Germany. They started with their pneumatic systems which they ship to their customers. And pneumatic systems, you know, there's a lot of air pressure always, and you, they, they, they want to measure if there's a leak somewhere, and pressuring the air with the compressor is uh, in, uh, energy intensive. So you want to have transparency about the usage of this equipment. And nobody knows the pneumatic system better than Festo. So they decided where to collect the data and how to interpret it to make use of that for the operator. And this is exactly what they've done, and they did some very nice applications. And if somebody of you was here four weeks ago here in Hanover on site, there was the industrial fair. They presented this um, live in the Mindsphere Lounge in, in Hall 9 back then. Very nice to see, very transparent what they, what they actually achieved in a couple of, of months with developing applications on Mindsphere. I talked about the digital twin very briefly. But actually, if you look a little bit closer, I want to give you some insights because there are three digital twins if you want to have a complete picture. So first, starting at the left-hand side, the digital twin of the product. The product itself. Let's take a laptop. A laptop is designed in a CAD system. It's 3D. There's the fan, the board. Everything is placed, the display. And today, that stops not there. Today, if you have designed your product in a 3D CAD environment, you start to simulate it with simulation tools. You don't build a prototype. You simulate how the temperature is developing when using it one hour, two hour, three hour. Oh, maybe the little fan is too small and I need a bigger one. Otherwise, I get overheated. That is all simulated today before you build the first prototype. So you iterate a lot of things. Uh, a lot of times before you go in the physical world. So that's the first digital twin. And this is what we had for a while, I guess, when we talked about digital twin. But it was enhanced more and more and more with all the simulation tools which you have around it now. But then you have it designed. Let's take that laptop. And then you need to manufacture it. So usually you then build in the past a production line and you had a, a, ser a null series and these kind of things. Today you also design your production digitally. You basically use the building blocks of machines, of production steps. You simulate it, see if the robots collide, if you want to have the windshield from the top or from the, from the front. How is the best way to actually design the production process for the product you just designed? And if you find out that 
the fan is very difficult to um, actually put there in this manufacturing, then you could go back to design, change it, and go back to the manufacturing uh, design and change it there as well. So you have iteration loops to optimize also the production for specifically that process without building anything. And the nice part about this, once you have done it and you have your production line digitally designed, you can then press a button and you get even your automation PLC programming done more or less automatically as well, which was done to, until the recent past with programming still uh, for the automation level of the manufacturing side. That, that's the second digital twin of production. But then there's the third one, when the product is actually in use. And there, there comes IoT into play mainly, because then you can collect data from that device, that machine, that car, that turbine, that compressor while in use. And you can then compare, does it behave exactly like I designed it or not? If a compressor was designed to have a constant uh, rotation temperature like this and a certain vibration in order to have at least a, a, a maintenance window of two years, but then you find out that the vibration is way bigger than you anticipated because some of the screws were not long enough and the pressure on the screws um, to mount the, monitor, uh, the motor to, to the rest of the sh uh, chassis of the compressor, you find that out and you can change the design because you find it out, you, you basically use the real operational data and feed it into your digital twin of the product. And you have all the simulation around there. And then you can see where it deviates to change the product faster than ever before. Because otherwise, you would have figured it out once this compressor example failed dozens and dozens of times. Only then you said, oh, maybe there's something wrong with the design. You find it out way, way more faster if you use the data from IoT and feed it back in the digital twin of the product. And let me give you a very concrete example with a large customer that is using that MindSphere application, which we call product intelligence today. It's Dell. Coincidence, it's a laptop here. And Dell is feeding into the product intelligence app of MindSphere terabytes of data per, per week. It's coming from the suppliers. It's coming from their production system. It's coming from their customer care system. And let, let me give you even a more concrete example if Dell. So if you have an issue with your laptop, you call the hotline. The first thing you have to give them is the identification number of the laptop. And then you give them the issue you have actually observed with your laptop. It goes into the system. And if now the system globally detects that a certain combination of motherboard and firmware and graphic card and hard drive fails more often, they detect it within hours. Before that, it took them weeks, sometimes months, to find out that there is a pattern. Now they find it out in hours. And what do they do? They go back to the website and basically block that combination that it cannot be ordered anymore. Because otherwise, they would have continued chip for weeks, for months, the same configuration the customer could choose. So they basically go back to the design, which the customer can, can select a lot of options, and block this combination. And they will not run into the problem again. That saves them millions and millions every year, just to link, close this loop between the digital twins. So but there are also. Completely other example, as you know, Siemens is in a lot of verticals. Uh, rail is uh, another one. And uh, that's an example from Spain, where the availability, uh, other than Deutsche Bundesbahn, um, of high-speed trains is 99%. And it's also done because there's a lot of data collected from those trains. And one of the very critical pieces, uh, which are monitored very closely, are the brakes. High-speed train brakes is very own animal by itself. So the colleagues built a 50 layers neural network with a very, very high predictability on when these brakes need maintenance. And this was the major change for them because they have, can say that in two to three months in advance. So they have a completely optimized maintenance schedule for these most critical asset pieces of the train, which are the brakes. 
which was a game changer for the Spanish railroad. And now we are rolling it out. Some of you might have heard that Deutsche Bahn also signed with us a similar contract now for the cargo locomotives. Not for the ICE yet, but I hope we are, we are getting there as well. Another very nice example, and now I want to broaden the view a little bit, is Expo 2020. It will be the largest expo ever. You know that uh, the colleagues in UAE are very ambitious. And uh, Mindsphere was selected to be the, the operating system for that. And this is a specific new challenge, because if you look what will be connected there, it's a very, very broad range of assets and use cases, which have been so far all in silos. So there was the silo of the public transport. There was the silo of the building management. There was the silo of the event itself and crowd management. And there was the silo of the energy flow and the renewable uh, energy which they have. They didn't even talk to each other. Uh, and if you want to connect some of these systems, you need to call a system integrator and spend millions. And if you want to have a change, you needed to call them again. So and with IoT in general, and specifically now with Mindsphere, with all these domain expertise that Siemens brings to the table, we will start to bridge those gaps. We will start to have these silos connected. And uh, one of the first uh, use cases, and we are, we are heavily working on that right now, will be very visible, will be the Expo 2020. And if I look now how, how this works, if we have cross um, vertical teams thinking about how they could utilize the data which they have in a data lake scenario like this, they come up with ideas which uh, we haven't dreamt about, I think, in, in the last years yet. Now they seem possible and affordable as well. So this will be a very nice thing to, to show. But we are not doing this alone as Siemens. In the IT world, there's always the co-opetition partnering is a key element of bringing something to market, of making business and providing customer value, because there is no one party, can it be as big as you want, who can provide everything. So we designed Mindsphere from the beginning as a very open ecosystem. Not only that the technology is as open as we can get, which is maybe not that common for uh, uh, the Siemens in the past, but we changed that. And you can see with the partner ecosystem which we have put in place around consulting strategy, around application developers, the technology itself. So we also include uh, third party technology into the platform. The system integrators for sure. The, we call them the hybrid OT, the partner switch and solution uh, system integrators coming from the automation level, as well as connectivity partners like uh, Bluetooth, Beacons, and, and so on. So we have a couple of examples here. We are closing now 100 partners globally who have signed on the Mindsphere ecosystem, and it's growing dramatically. And it's good to see that it's a, a large community which creates a lot of great ideas and, and business value already. So summarizing the Mindsphere piece, as I said, available on infrastructures on AWS and, and, and Azure. Uh, as preview right now, it's about to build IoT apps fast. It's open. You can even combine it with the capabilities of the underlying infrastructure. We, we keep that open as well. It has extensive connectivity on the asset side, which you, I think you can believe coming from Siemens, but also now since January on the enterprise IT side as well. And we have integ integrated a lot of uh, analytical advanced analytical capabilities um, as we speak already. And the global partner ecosystem, we are all not alone. So with that, I come to the last statement. What about the future? What about the outlook? So the examples which I shared with you show that it's the time to start now. A lot of, of the industrial companies are actually starting as we speak. Some of them have already started, and we see the first results and examples here. I hardly know any one of them who hasn't started an initiative or a digitalization project, which is hopefully directly reporting to the, the management and the executives there in order to figure out what's the best way to start digitalization from my business. 
And there was a nice quote, uh, I think it was last year around this time, from an uh, IT and engineering magazine, which th stated that Mindsphere looks to me like the entry drug for Industry 4.0 because it lowers the hurdle to get started so much. You don't need to spend millions. You need to spend a couple hundred euros to get a, a developer plan on Mindsphere and start. So and then the limits are your imagination. And as, as you see, there are more and more examples where you can start to learn and look and see what fits, what doesn't fit for me. And usage and performance output will be the trend, if we like it or not. From an equipment supplier perspective and customers operators will ask, I don't want to own all of this equipment. I want to have the results, the output, and the guarantees and availability for it. And therefore, if you want to be able to offer this to your customer and don't lose that competitive edge, which you might have on the technology or the product side, then it's time to start now. Thank you. Ralph, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Do we have any questions from the audience? That was a lot of information right over here. The mic is coming towards you. Hi. So many of these new business models are based on customers allowing their data to go back to the manufacturer. Yeah. Shouldn't the customers then charge the manufacturer for their data? So we have a principle, um, in our, also in our TS, TNCs, who is the data owner? And for us, we think the, the data owner is the one who is generating it and ingesting it into Mindsphere. So this is a basic principle. And anything else can then be agreed between the parties. Because if you are still the owner of that machine and you're interesting as a, take an, an automotive supplier and you, uh, um, automotive manufacturer and you interest, have your data and interest in the mind, so you should be the owner. But maybe you cannot interpret that data and then you give access to that data to somebody else who then has an app to interpret the data from that machine in the right way that actually provides you benefit. And then you have to, do, they, those two have to negotiate what's the right way in order to price the value and also deliver the value. And if the one party says, I give you the data, and that's why you need to give me the insights for free, I don't think that's going to work, but some try. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Ah, thanks. So given that uh, years ago, something similar with data happened with the music labels, and how music was first brought on online. Have you given consideration to a license system that allows the owners of the data to be able to do revocation? What do you mean, the revocation? So in other words, if I have an agreement that says I have access to the data, yep. but then I need to have a way to be able to revoke that if the agreement changes. Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So if you, the concept is implemented in Minds Future Day, the data owner then gives access or allows access to another app for that specific data. And at any time, they say, we cut it. They stay the owner of the data. And they keep in control. It's a very important mechanism which we had to put in place because the customer asks this from, from day one. And if they want to sell it to somebody else, it's also their, their decision. At least we don't have anything to do with the data from, from the Siemens side. Thank you. Do you have any more questions? I have one for you, if I may. Sure. So um, what are major errors that you see when companies move to using industrial IoT? So where we see that programs uh, or companies that start get stuck very fast if they don't think about the overall holistic strategy, what they want to actually achieve. If they just say, okay, oh, give me access to Mindsphere and I want to start and play around, without a clear objective, it's going to die. And they say, oh, it's not going to work for us. And then you need to spend time with those customers. You make ideation workshops and then define together with them where they want to go. It, it's their decision at the end of the day. Without that, things are not being successful. Thank you. If there are no more questions from the audience, 
I want to thank you so much. Please, thank big you, round Alex. of applause for Ralph. Thank, thank you. you so much. Have a nice day at CBIT.